today my friend George Salas on. He's the CEO of Empress Capital, a maestro in short-term vacation rentals, and a veteran in real estate investment. George's journey has been about transforming lives through real estate, from aiding distressed property owners to empowering new entrepreneurs. He's a firm believer in financial freedom and the joy of successful investments. Outside of the office, George enjoys soccer, family time, and his Peruvian roots. For more on his insights, check out georgesalas360.com and get ready for a great episode packed with lots of valuable insights. So without further ado, let me bring George on. Hey, what's up, brother? Hey, brother. How are you, man? Oh, we're doing <laughs> good. Having... Absolutely. We're really excited yeah, to have wow. you here. Yeah. What we usually do to kick it off is just have uh, you give your kind of background story to everybody and how you got to where you are today. Oh, absolutely. I'm ready. Let me know when uh, we can go. Yeah, take it away. Uh, first of all, Matt, Matt and Mark, a pleasure to uh, be here with you today. So thanks for inviting me. Um, Absolutely. Super excited about sharing some golden nuggets about short-term vacation rentals here with everyone. So um, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a six-year short-term rental operator, and my journey really uh, started when I was uh, six years old. So I'll take us through a five-minute journey about how I came to be where I am today. So um, I was six, parents were getting a divorce. This is Lima, Peru, right? And um, we had to fly out with my mom to a different city. And it was a small town. We were actually moving away uh, from my dad and uh, my parents were getting divorced, right? So um, we go and live in this Adobe house for nine years, okay? <laughs> so Adobe house and then half of that house had melted because the roof had collapsed so we didn't have a living room okay we didn't have a, a dining room or a living room so we sort of lived in one room here for grandma that was split you know and then the other room was for us and then we have sort of a kitchen right where we ate so that that was me growing up and um didn't see my dad for nine years and at the age of 15 he came back into my life and at that time my mom had uh, remarried and we got the pleasure of moving uh, moving here to the U.S. and um, that's where a whole journey started, right? So going from an Adobe house to, to um, you know, being where we are today with you know private equity, short term rentals, and you know just being blessed, right? So um, as I grew up, I went into hospitality between you know ages of uh, 17 and 18. Um, fast forward to 25, I worked in the restaurant and service business for about seven or eight years. Right. And uh, I was into a transition to do something bigger. Right. So um, I started a, a movement, right. Um, a movement that uh, turned into a marketing uh, business of, of promotions and hosting events and doing production. So I did that for about 10 years from the age about 23 to 33. Um, I did again in hospitality, right. But just a different area of hospitality. Right. I, I, uh, created events, right. From the production, to the planning, to the marketing, and even the hosting. And these were at nightclubs and event venues. So we would have events in the evenings and we'd have events at, at nighttime. And we would bring people together almost every single day and night of the week, right? We we did one-off events um, for New Year's Eve, every holiday, right? With big, like our biggest one was 3,000 people. And this is, I'm talking about at venues in the city where you have a thousand people in a venue, right? And that's, <laughs> I mean, you still see that today, but I don't attend those anymore, right? <laughs> so, uh, fast forward a little bit um, uh, later on, I was able to, um, at the age of 33, save a few hundred thousand dollars after being in this industry for seven, six, seven years, you know, and uh, I was, uh, I wanted something more. I wanted to invest in, and I wanted to become an investor, right? And so I, I was approached by one of the people that I worked with and for, right? Um, he was somebody that hired us to, to market his venue. And um, essentially we had um, had some money and, and I had the ability to gather people together, get investors right um, from that scene, um, get people to follow us. So we were very approachable. We were the best in the city at the time. Um, so we started building a nightclub, right? Uh, an event venue slash nightclub, right? I ended up putting a couple hundred thousand dollars over a course of two years as an LP Right. And uh, I back then I thought being an LP was the greatest thing. Didn't really understand what it was. Right. Like we do now. Um, so the gentleman was a GP. 
And then we had different LPs come in and, um, you know, limited partners and into the deal. And I was able to gather people and he obviously closed them. So I was bringing people on board to uh, put together this, this project, right? So and these are people that we all knew from the industry, investors that invest in the industry. They like the quick money because they love being out there and, and being themselves called owners of, of, an, of a nightclub or a venue, right? It attracts and then brings power to them. So um, that was an experience, right? Being uh, an owner for about uh, a year and a half, right? So fast forward a year and a half after we opened, we had opened in such a um, a debt, right? That that one thing that we didn't realize was that the GP of the deal actually ended up not renegotiating the back rent payments of this triple net lease where we built this brand new $1.3 million venue, right? So the landlord had taken us to court and at about 18 months from the time we opened, they shut our doors down. So I lost everything that I've saved for, you know, six, seven years, right? Over $300,000. All the investors lost their money and I had absolutely no power and I couldn't do anything. Biggest lesson there is vet the operator, right? Don't put all your eggs into one basket, divert, diversify. So my investing career started uh, on, on a rock bottom journey, right? So, but fast forward, and it was the beginning of my real estate, you know, how, how I got into real estate and essentially um, that pushed me forward because I couldn't stay where I, where I was at, right? I, I had absolutely nothing, right? I hadn't built any wealth or long-term cash flow. It was, it was gone. All, everything was gone I've ever worked for. So that was a wake up moment. And I had two breakthroughs, gentlemen. One was an internal breakthrough that was telling me that I can't stay where I'm at, right? Like I'm, I'm better than this, right? And then an external breakthrough that was a friend of mine called me and he said, I, I need you to come to my flip, right? He had a flip here in Houston, Texas. We went to his flip and boom, those two moments woke me up and it, it, it awakened the giant bit, uh, within is what Tony Robbins calls it, right? So there was a giant that woke up and that was the beginning of my real estate journey. Fast forward six months later, I had done 15 real estate deals. Fast forward, my first year in real estate brought in about $300,000 revenue from, from my real estate business. Had already 10 short-term rentals and I was doing fix and flipping, wholesaling, you know, just really figuring out, like learning the real estate and I was really taking action you know, and then that was the beginning of all, right? And fast forward now, we've done over 110 deals, um, 60 to 70 launched short-term rentals, but we've taken our business from launching a quantity and volume of short-term rentals into quality short-term rentals. We only do median size to about, so 350 to about $750,000 homes right now. And we convert them into mid-luxury properties. Um, you know, we maximize the revenue and income per year. Almost every property we have brings uh, around six figures, you know, 80 to about $160,000, the biggest one per year, right? And we've launched a private equity fund recently. Uh, we do single deals, we do joint ventures with our partners, and, and we get to hang out with Mark and Matt, gentlemen like you, high level people in our mastermind, right? Race masters. So, a little bit about me. I mean, I went like seven minutes, but I hope that was okay. <laughs> that was really good. Yeah. Maybe dive in a little bit on the uh, fund that you created. What was that process like and how's it going? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it started, started in the group with me really just wanting to scale our business. So middle of 22, right. Or beginning of 22, my wife and I are like, Hey, how are we going to really take what we've built? Right. Which at the time was, was decent, right. With, without a lot of private capital, right. In, in real estate, uh, we had a great portfolio, but it wasn't it wasn't the, 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 what we wanted in the sense that it was a lot of properties. It was a lot of hustle, a lot of work, but it wasn't quality, right? So what we have today, about 18 doors, 18 houses, right? A little bit over $8 million in, in, in assets under management, right? It's, you know, it crushes what we had in 2022, right? 20, at the end of 2021, 20, 20, right? So we transitioned and just trying to figure out how are we really going to take that next 10, 10 X step. Right. So, um, I just, you know, I was looking in internet and, and I was looking at webinars and we ran into Hunter Thompson's webinar. I saw the webinar and 
we joined. And then from there, you know, um, it, it was the first step, right? It was the, the commitment step, right? That commitment step that I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to join here and figure out like, what's my next step. I didn't know I was going to launch a fund yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, made me create, it created the courage inside me to be able to take that leap of faith, right? Commitment creates courage in each one of us. So started the process in the middle of 22, right? Really learning how this private equity world works, right? I'm an operator, been doing this business for six years, but this capital raising slash private equity is a completely different world. You already know that, right? Mm -hmm. So it took me three to five months of learning, right? Just really figuring out what I really wanted to do, what, what we wanted to create. And at the beginning of 23 this year, right? is when we really started doing the business and it took nine months from there um to really launch because i mean these things take a while right so um as you already know i think we've been keeping up with each other in in, in, in our mastermind uh, things take time and in a great product you've got to put together you know you've got to put the time into it so we went and got every resource from our group and if it wasn't for race masters i we wouldn't have been able to create this right so uh we launched a our first 10 million dollar fund focused on median size short term rentals the same model that's been successful for us over the last three to four years right and um yeah we just uh we're in our first round right now um doing very well we're working on the marketing and things should go well like um you know we've put together an amazing product that we're super proud of right so we're just ready to go and launching with a lot of speed and momentum into 2024 and ending the year you know 10 i've done 10 deals outside the fund this year 10 short-term vacation rentals that we've acquired most of them through creative finance you know it's nice a little bit of that. Yes, so excellent so um we're hearing from a lot of capital raisers in this environment that we're kind of in a weird spot right now that it's harder to raise capital than ever before with elevated interest rates and that sort of thing so what are you seeing out there uh, as a capital raiser yourself? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Matt. Um, I am seeing a little bit of uncertainty, right? We've gone through a couple single races, you know, where uh, the money just is coming in, but it's coming in slow, right? People are a little bit uncertain about the environment, the economic environment right now. I mean, we're going into an election year here in, you know, 12 months. I mean, well, the next month we're going into the election year, but, you know, we're 12 months away from it. And, I think there's going to be even more uncertainty in the 2024, even though the interest rates just got lowered a little bit. I think this week, you know, I, I, I read some news about, you know, uh, lower interest rates and there's predictions. There are predictions that are going to, that the interest rates are going to lower even more. Um, but it is a little bit harder to raise capital right now. And people are uncertain, right? Um, we work with fund managers um, in, in, in our group. And then they themselves are like, man, it's just a, three to four times harder to raise capital than two years ago, right? So um, we are diversifying in a way that we market to raise capital for our fund, right? So we're working with not just fund managers, but also different groups of retail investors, right? So um, now given that, we're going to see, you know, as we're just in the beginning stages, how all that uh, unfolds. So super excited, you know, and at the same time, you know, when you're, when you're taking that leap into the next 10x step of your life, you know, it, it makes you nervous. And if you're not nervous about something, then you're doing something wrong, right? Yeah. So that's where we are right now. So uh, speaking of deal flow, for instance, because uh, I'm completely unfamiliar with the short-term rental space. Well, I, I, I'm i a recovering Air, Airbnb host, all right? I, I, I did it basically by accident. And uh, <laughs> to have a place for my, in, for my in-laws, we had a baby and they want to stay in town for longer periods of time. So... Um, so we, you know, created one of my apartments into one. Right. Um, so I hate to use the term like buy box, like what's your buy box? Because for me, I'm out there, I look, I look for problems and then I draw boxes around those problems. Um, but if you were to say like the type of like pro like the type of property in terms of like, what is the, you know, the boxes that it needs to check when you're out there looking for opportunities, what does that look like? Absolutely. So we have, a few boxes there. I, I like where you're going with this, Matt. Um, well, number one, when it comes to our personal portfolio, uh, my wife and I invest here locally in Houston and within 65 miles of our home, right? So um, 
But when it comes to the fund, two different buy boxes, right? So the fund itself um, is investing into recession resistant markets. We're opening up different markets um, where there, there has been history of slow and relative growth in the real estate environment, which means historically between 2007 to 12, um, we're going for markets that had a, an average of a 5% growth, right? In the median price, not volatile markets or not, no markets that have gone negative, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to investing in those markets, our first buy point and checkbox in that buy box is that it has to meet the relative change growth strategy, right? It has to have had history of slow growth, not volatile like Vegas growth, right? Like Scottsdale and then a great freaking low crash, right? We don't want that. We want steady growth in our market. So that's number one. Number two has to have the amenities that the people in that market love and want the most, right? Because love, not necessarily want, is one thing. Because we sometimes give people what they what they want, but they really need what they love, right? Like they really need comfy, comfy beds. They need, you know, um, more amenities, like the main essential amenities, a great kitchen, right? But what they love and what they're attracted by is completely different. They're attracted by the shiny object of, of awesome amenities outdoors, like pools and hot tubs and, you know, large backyards. So we want to give them both, right? So when we look for a home, we're looking at what they really need. So Right. The market's going to say that we need that the people in there or the customers, guests, one X, Y, Z, like pools and hot tubs. But we're also going to deliver right the, the essential amenities. So buy box number two is essential amenities, major amenities such as pools, hot tubs or what the market wants. For example, a mountain, a mountain property that most of the year is you know like it's, it's a vacation rental i mean a pool isn't a number one amenity maybe the views are mm -hmm. right so that's what they want they want to be out there to connect themselves when they're booking with being able to spend time with their families overseeing the mountain right and connecting so that's another um another buy box i'll say is um essentially uh, capturing the right number of uh guests right in in each property so if a market attracts larger groups then our property in that market has to have four five six bedrooms mm -hmm. right so a few examples like that so we follow trends right and the 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 most efficient way to follow trends gentlemen is to be ahead of the curve so we see what those the people in those markets love and want and we're ahead of it because we're going to give them that plus what they know they're going to want, need, and what they love, right? So additional things. That's what's been setting us apart over the years as we've, you know, really refined our process. And, and when it comes to acquisitions and um, as well as manage, managing these properties, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, little follow-up question. It's random. If I can ask it, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. Um, so... Uh, I've, uh, I've, you know, I've stayed at some of these, uh, higher end, uh, re rentals and that sort of thing. You know, one of the things that like absolutely bugs the crap out of me is like, we'll rent like a multi-million dollar home with a absolutely gorgeous kitchen, right. That wants you to cook in it. And they have like, you know, cheap target, like, uh, you know, knives and that, and that sort of thing. Like, uh, you know, those like super cheap, like serrated knives and that sort of thing. Like, do you have like, a total like you know specification down to like all the new, like little tiny nitty gritty things in all of your prop like in all of your properties that keep that continuity and that guest that guest experience across the board absolutely when i first started i used to be that walmart guy where i would buy all my stuff <laughs> by myself at walmart right and i was like i'm gonna save as much money as i can and get the cheapest stuff and i'm gonna make all the money right mm -hmm. so it doesn't work that way <laughs> right. You get what you pay for and people's expectations when you're charging eight, nine hundred dollars a night are completely different. 
So we have a list. It's a replica for each property. Three, four, five. We don't really go into three bedrooms much, right? Um, we have a list and, and you know, a blueprint mm -hmm. that allows us to just go through each, right? And the only thing that doesn't have a blueprint when it comes to staging and designing a property is the theme and the mm -hmm. vision behind that property on what it's going to look like. That is a customized approach for every single deal, right? So 100% and that helps, right? When, and we've stepped up our level, um, you know, our, our game year over year and the, the level of quality that you provide. And it's, you know, it's also a confidence thing, right? Whenever you store something, you want to save as much money as you can if you're not confident that's going to work, mm -hmm. right? That's how most people think. But one thing I did forget to mention, gentlemen, is that a lot of the property we are acquiring right now whether it's our personal portfolio or the fund, right? Or through creative finance, right? And this goes against everything, right? Meaning lower interest rate, two, three, four, five percent, right? Something I forgot to mention earlier, right? And it, it is crazy. If you want to dig a little deeper into what we're doing with these sub twos, I'll be happy to share. Yeah. Are there certain states that are more favorable towards the sub two? And have you run into any states where it just really doesn't work? I know New York is is not a state that's very friendly on sub two. Yes. Um, I am not familiar with the laws um, in other states, but as far as Texas is completely legal, right? And there are a lot more nuances than, than what you think, right? We um, So far, we've done like probably about 25 sub two deals this last four or five years, right? And 10 of them has been in the last year, I'm sorry, 12 months. So regulations can vary, but for the most part, right? They, this strategy is fantastic and it is legal, completely legal. Um, and it works because you're saving not just on a down payment, which increases investor returns, right? Cause you're, you're buying a property with, maybe 10, 15% equity instead of 20% equity, right? And you're getting that equity automatically built in, right? You're putting down instead of 25% in an investment loan, you're putting down 10% or less, right, into this deal. So your returns double to triple based on just that one fact, right? Not given the fact that short term rentals create additional cash flow. So it bumps our IRR, right, based on that cash on cash. So what's the motivation for that particular seller that they're willing to do the sub two? And then wouldn't they have problems if they wanted to go out and buy another house because that debt is still showing under their name? I, I great question, Mark. I love it. So there are a lot of motivations behind these sellers, right? The number one motivation that I believe is they are in a distress situation, mostly because something happened they, they had an event in their life recently and they cannot sell their property for one or two reasons on the multiple listing service right whether it's like they're getting a divorce and they need to sell quickly to maybe i bought it and then you know they're i mean there's not enough 10 percent to sell a the property there's not enough equity they might not be 10 percent, or the property needs repairs they can't sell on mls Right. And then basically they're, they're not willing to do cash. The sub two strategy is faster. Right. As long as it's it's well communicated from the, the person that's acquiring it. Right. And all the disclosures are are done. This this strategy is all about disclosures. Right. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. So in our sub twos, our closing documents are about 60 different pages of disclosures, 60, 50 to 60. And it's page after page, like legally you have to disclose not all 60 of them, but there's about four or five, you know, let me give you an example. Like you have to disclose about the insurance. You have to disclose about an underlying lien, right? You have to disclose as a buyer, you have to disclose your seller. And as a seller selling that sub two to an investor, they must also sign that they understand that. And then they have to give us, these notices. So it's like a both, it's a two way street, right? And most people out there, 90% of them, they do not know what they're doing when it comes to sub twos. Now they can get the deals done. They can acquire these 
single family or multifamily via sub two or whatever. But the problem lands in all the nuances and in the new laws that have been passed. Perfect example, Texas, right? They they passed a bunch of new laws and every single year it changes, right? And then the title companies, they're a middleman that basically they're getting, it's kind of like, you know, if you're an investor, um, or let me just give a different example, right? And if, if you, uh, if you're a service provider and you specialize on, let's just say selling logos, creating and selling logos, but then you have customers coming in saying, Hey, I want a website, I want a website. Now you're like, Oh, well, I see a lot of money being missed. I'm going to sell websites. These title companies are taking these clients because you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of investors reaching out for them to, to do the creative finance deals without knowing, without having the proper disclosures and having the proper paperwork, which makes it all legal. And then they give you a disclosure for them saying that, hey, I, I'm just giving you the paperwork. I'm a third party. You can't come back and sue me, right? Even though I gave you the wrong paperwork, you cannot sue me. So that's the biggest problem that I see in sub twos. What we've done is we search for the best people in the industry to close these deals, right? Not just best get the best deals, build the best relationships on the front end, but you've got to have the right attorney. And then the attorney has to be specialized in creative finance. That's the biggest thing about sub twos. Are you saying the cash people aren't buying them because there's not enough equity? Their cash price would be less than what's owed on the house, and that's why there's no cash transactions? And well, they I'm, I'm not saying no, not, it's not. What, what do you mean? Uh, well, you, your well, you had just said that uh, they can't sell it to a cash, a cash buyer, so I, I was just curious why. Or is it just a marketing thing? Once you get them on the phone, it's more about you know pitching your narrative, and then they're like, yeah, that sounds fine. I'm going to go with it. So I would imagine if there was equity that, you know, why wouldn't a cash buyer want to make an offer on that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's, I, I think it's not just about the cash buyer. I think it's more like they're, they're not, these people aren't selling their homes because they're in a distressed, right? Distressed state. And as an investor, if the investor comes in and this, this people need to sell their homes fast, right? Then a cash buyer, I mean, they buy cash, they're going to, have to refinance that thing right and it's going to be nine percent interest rate on that on that deal so it's not it's more on the on the smarts of the investor in my opinion than it is more on the on the seller then right yeah. so, so they, they're just not offering enough that makes it interesting for the seller you can you can offer a little bit more because you're getting those those better terms 100 percent, right if i get it we're closing on a 2.8 percent deal that i'm um, I'm running right now a 2.8% interest rate deal next week, right? I would have never bought that if it was cash. Okay. I would, I mean, even if I had the loan lined up, it would have been 9%, right? So this is a $400,000 house. There's no reason. Like sub two is the best thing ever created in the planet when it comes to real estate for me at least, right? <laughs> I got one more question that I'll let Matt take it away. So I know you were saying you're, you want to get a good location. It's got to have amenities. It's got to, your buy box is pretty specific. If you overlay this distressed seller on top of that, that seems like it might reduce the amount of opportunities that you have, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. Are you, if you find an opportunity where it's uh, compliant with what you're looking for, they're willing to do a sub two, are you a little bit more lenient on the location and say, Hey, we can make this work. Or are you still pretty strict with that buy box and say, it's got to have the mountain view or it's got to have whatever. You great question. So now most sub twos are not going to meet the specific niche buy boxes. Okay. So we have to get a lot of deal flow, which we do, right? A lot of deal flow. And a lot of the sub twos are only part of our portfolio diversification because most sub twos are not going to be on a mountain, right? Those properties will sell faster. They're going to be in your major cities, right? And we look for appreciating markets for those sub twos. So when it comes to um, changing our buy box, the fund has the, its buy boxes per market. So it does not change those and how we're buying and acquiring the deals, right? How we're getting the deal flow is specific to those markets, right? So, we go and connect with um, a bunch of wholesalers and creative finance groups for that specific market, but you have to do it 
based basically connecting first with the people in the city, right? So let me give you an example. If we want to go to um, Lakeview, Austin, or you want to get deals around Austin, Texas, the people getting those deals are are acquisitions people that are inside Austin, Texas, right? So when it comes to when it comes to actually getting the types of deals. Um, we are not flexible in the fund, but we are flexible when it comes to doing single deals, right? And, then de and it depends what market we're in at that time. But we do get, I mean, at least 15 to 20 deals a week, right? Which, uh, which is great, but it's, it's not exactly at, at, at the number that we need. We need like 200 to 300 deals a month in order for us to be able to underwrite and get those niche properties. Mm hmm Ask your question. Yeah. So, uh, George, what is the uh, what is the targeted term for the fund? Like, when when are you um, planning on winding the fund down after you've implemented this strategy? Absolutely. We um, our launch date um, was November twenty seventh. We just pushed it by a month, so it's a twelve month um, open open period. Um, we're, we've got, you know, different periods where we're going to be bringing in the capital, uh, different tranches. So, um, closing towards the end of next year, I mean, there is an option for us to be able to extend the timeline a little bit. Um, so and the term is, you know, it's a five-year term, uh, for our fund with a one to two year, uh, extension possible, depending on, you know, how the market's playing at that time. So high level, like what's your, what's your exit strategy on this, like a uh, five, uh, five year term for these assets? I love that question. So we are reverse engineering a sell to an institutional buyer, which we believe an institutional buyer within the next five years will be ready to buy. Right. And we are creating stable returns in an unstable economy by um doing a couple of strategies right um one of them is we're fluctuating our operating costs with some of our you know in-house fees like the management fee We've, since we have an in-house management company we're making a a tweak within our um within our operating you know costs so that it stays stable right so we've created a a, a way to do that right and our goal there is Right. We reverse engineer. We build what an institutional buyer wants to buy. Right. And then we do it by understanding what they want mm -hmm. and what they want is stable returns with a growing NOI. Right. That can produce the returns they are looking for. Yes. or No. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, we have a couple people in mind, a couple buyers in mind already. Right. And uh, we're basically there's no time for us to reach out to them, but we're, we're seeing what companies they are buying. Right. Currently. So and then that's how we're reverse engineering our strategy. Right. And, and as we grow this, you know, we know what our portfolio is going to produce. So what we that's not exactly what they look like, like they look for these companies actually look for portfolios because there's a lot of real estate portfolios that can perform, but there are well, some might be riskier than others. Some might not create the cash on cash return they're looking for or the returns, right? So we're specifically tweaking our fund so that it performs to that environment. Okay. So I think I'm understanding here. So uh, um, typically institutional buyers, they want to place large amounts of capital, right? Uh, 500,000 to $750,000 is not going to be enough to blow their hair back on that. But like, let's say a 10 to $15 million deal of assets that have a track record of pr producing stable cash flows. I think it's kind of like what the, what they're gonna be looking for when this thing comes full cycle. Am I correct in that characterization? Yes. And in, in addition to that one point is the stable cash flows with the stable NOI, mm -hmm. right? And obviously capped operating costs that are now fluctuating. And you know, the one thing about short-term rentals is that it does fluctuate based on seasonality, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at trends of one year, right? We want to make, because you're going to fluctuate between your January, February, up and down because of seasonality. But what did 
what did this portfolio perform year over year compared next to each other? Did it grow? Did, did the revenue and, and an NOI slowly grew, right, based on each year separately, or uh, was it up and down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So maybe there's going to be some diversification around uh, geographies that maybe have like a blend of diff of like sort of complementary seasonalities, so as to produce uh, globally a more stable uh, stable uh, stream of cash flows. Absolutely, we invest in three. Well, two out of the three. I'm sorry, two out of the three. But then we're diversifying into sub niches, right? So. To give you a good perspective, you have three major ways to look at markets. You have your metro markets, which have subcategories of urban, suburban, and rural. You have your regional markets, which have mountains and lakes, right? Mountain lakes slash beaches. And then you have your national flyout markets. The difference between the regional and national or the national markets, we don't invest in national markets, are the most expensive real estate, the most, the highest revenue, but also the highest risk and the highest volatility. Those national markets are not ex not within our buy box, and, and, and it just speaks because they just don't fit the relative change growth strategy. The regional and metro are right. So let me give you a perfect example. I'm here in Houston, Texas. We just purchased a deal in Cypress, Texas, right? And this market has grown an, ad, an average of five to six percent in appreciation over the last 10 years right it didn't even get touched during the recession in 2007 the numbers look good and the revenue is increasing in that market for our six to seven bedrooms short-term rentals five to seven at a rate of 14 to 15 percent per year why is that well i mean you're in cypress texas is sort of a neighborhood in the in this around city of houston and you have all these neighborhoods blocking short-term rentals you know like literally just that you can't do short-term rentals then we have you know certain little areas that we're investing in where you know we're going into unrestricted neighborhood uh, neighborhoods in this in this market right so revenue is growing there's less supply right the appreciation is slow and steady exactly like we want it right we look for all these little factors there where are you getting the uh, data on the preferred number of bedrooms and configuration of your units for your particular markets? Uh, we use a couple softwares, Mark. Um, the main one, right? It's it's an extension of AirDNA called Tableau, right? So it is a data aggregator that has put AirDNA's data in a much better way. We're able to download the data. It's like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month for the software, right? So we use that. We also use Air DNA as as a quick, fast, right, um, overseer. But it's the same data, right? The only difference is um, that one puts it in a different way to view it, and it, you're able to download easily because the data aggregator will, you know, that's exactly what they do. So it's a partnership there. We use another tool called All the Rooms, AllTheRooms.com. And we use Mash Visor as well as a third or fourth um, idea. And then, then, then um, I'm sure you guys have heard of this tool, maybe not, but yeah, since Mark, Matt, since you have a, you had a short term rental, uh, there's a tool called Price Labs that has a component of, uh, of, of pricing uh, and in market, you know, market pricing. So we utilize these four tools in conjunction with each other. We just, look at different and some are going to have different data right so you kind of pick out the best data of each and then the data is, is more about the comps right can you find the most accurate comps sometimes you'll see you know most of this data is not live so you'll find some properties that you know that maybe they were relisted or don't have you know reviews and then you know that makes it a little iffy to use so we try to look at different uh softwares that will pick up different data for us to make our decision right so and then we underwrite it at a very deep level, like every property goes through a very extensive underwriting at the property level before it rolls up to the fund underwriting uh, pro forma. Yeah. In the long term market, long term leases, uh, we find there's a market for everything, right? From a studio, one, two, three, four, five, six bedroom, there's a market for it. 
do you find the same thing in short-term rentals or are you saying that mm, no nah, there's gonna there might be some houses that just don't really fit the airbnb model for instance a small tiny house 800 square feet maybe one bedroom something like that is are, are those ones that you stay away from or would you say not necessarily you know if i get them for the right price we we would definitely add those to the portfolio i love it yeah we'll we would not get into the tiny home uh, uh strategy um, and the main reason, um, I mean, the main reason for that is just too small. And, and, and we want to be in a in, in, in a niche where, you know, we, we, we create six-figure revenues per every property, right? Well, our minimum is 75000 so close to six figures, right? So a tiny home would bring you 40, 50, even though it would be a lot cheaper, right? Operationally, it creates more, um, less efficiency, right? And more movement, more deals, more headaches, more work more staff to hire, more cleaning teams. So we want to stay away from two smaller properties right now. The markets have, the short-term rental market has maybe 15, 16, 18 different niches, right? We want to do one or two, right? Four to six bedroom homes, turn these into luxury because you could, you could even go into a four to six bedroom home and have different niches there, right? And we look at, okay, out of these four to six bedroom homes, which one is, you know, generating the most revenue, right? And those are the luxury revenue generators. Now there is budget, there is economy, you know, there is mid luxury and then there is luxury, right? There's four or five different strategies. And the, the, for us, the most efficient way has been getting the debt and acquiring these properties for less down with a cheaper form of debt, right? Four to five, three for three percent interest rates from sub twos. And then turning those properties that might maybe not fit the criteria of each property we're buying, but but we turn around, let's just get let's say we get a property for 30 grand. That's what I'm buying the sub two next week. It has a pool. I take that property, add everything I needed to perform at 117,000, which is our highest comp on this property we close next week in Pearland, Texas. So when I go in there and I might put less money down on the front end. But on the back end, I'm going to add an additional 30, 40, 50 K in furniture and outdoor furnishings, right? And maybe building a deck, building a game room out in this one little garage area that we had, building a putting green with a dog, little uh, fence area next to it. So all these things make us create that additional revenue, right? So the properties might not fit what we're looking for at first, but then when we look into it, we base it more of our comps, right? So when we make our decision, we're trying to see is like, are we gonna are we gonna be able to get by and create six figure revenues by investing thirty to forty k plus the renovation plus staging, let's say a hundred grand, right? So we're still at a pretty high number, right? But now instead of if we would have done the same thing in a nine percent purchase with a retail price, let's just say this property didn't have any equity, a nine percent. And, and we went, most people do this. Most operators will go and do exactly what I'm doing, but they'll buy a higher end property that is fully retail. They'll think that because it has a pool or a hot tub, it's going to make six figures or 120,000. It doesn't work for them. And then they're, they're like trying to figure out why am I not making any money? Well, first of all, you purchased the retail and got 9% debt, right? And yeah. trust me, it is tough out there right now with 9% interest rates. Yeah. That makes sense. Do you have problems yes, uh, when you're con when you're talking to LPs and they see that you know you're really familiar with one geographical area, and then you tell them, "Hey, I'm considering going into this other geographical area that we don't really have a track record or much experience." Is that been an issue, or is there has that even come up with, with discussions with LPs? It hasn't come up so far, um, and mainly because. The, the, it's not about the geographical area. It's, I believe it's mostly, uh, in today's world, I mean, you can get any data for the real estate prices, right? For real estate prices and then for the short term rental revenues and, and really just run an accurate operation. It comes down to our ability to operate efficiently by creating the relationships with our boots on the ground team. Right. So because we're operators and because we have we know where to look 
in how to build the relationships and how to still do it at a cost efficient way, it it's, has not been that big of a deal for, for us when it comes to, you know, talking to LPs or really just communicating that to, to anybody. Right. Um, when you go out there, you've just got to build the right team. And then it comes down to like, how much are these vendors going to charge us? Right. And can someone manage them operationally opening more markets makes it difficult. Right. But we're not opening 10 markets in fund one. We're only opening three to five. Right. Okay. So. Love it. Love it. So follow up question. Um, you know, Mark was trying to, you know, dig into some potential, I mean, every, every investor that you present an opportunity to is going to have common objections. So Mark, you know, kind of, uh, you know, was pulling on the thread of that a little bit. What objections have you been hearing in terms of, uh, um, common ones from your potential investment partners and, uh, how do you overcome those? Um, so one of the uh, most, you know, common objections that I've heard lately, it's been like, I don't know what's going to happen. The economy is uncertain, right? So, and this was like last week, right? Um, I heard it again. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen. It's hard to raise capital. Like people aren't interested, right? And my answer was, have, have you looked into our strategy in a little bit of a more deep deep than than you seem to know and we made one tweak right uh, before we launched or you know a few months before we launched we had not added the relative change this is like april of this year we're like four months away we added the relative change growth strategy in into our entire fund strategy and and, and that's been a big help because when whenever you you show them the research right that like you're comparing data Data doesn't lie, right? So that's been one way that I, we've overcome some objections. I mean, another one um, would be, you know, like, hey, what happens, you know, because um, we're actually we're actually going market when it comes to the returns, right? So they're saying, look, George, um, you're showing nine to eleven percent cash on cash, and you're that's what you're marketing on your projections, and in a sixteen percent IRR, right? What's the difference between that and a multifamily deal? Only a couple points, mm -hmm. right? So, but for us, um, we went market, right? That's what the market is offering when it comes to short term rentals. But what they're delivering is a completely different number. Okay. The, the average return to the investors is 25 to 30%, but the market, what we're marketing or what the competitors are marketing, right? We haven't had obviously a quarter yet um, of, of returns, but what we're marketing is 16%. So um, we just want to under promise and over deliver, right? Mm -hmm. Under promise and over deliver, right? So we know what the market is putting out there. We know what, what the numbers are coming out to and, and what the revenues are, but we don't want to go, all out at that number now internally when we have a conversation between us yes we're saying this i know we're live right now right but internally we can we see our partners we you know, we're like oh my god it's not really that much higher right than your 16 percent i'm multifamily i'm i'm getting x percent right 10 12 percent ir 15 percent ir it's like it's only one or two percent points higher well let's talk internally here right so that's how i mean that don't you guys agree that that's a uh, one uh, strategy to, uh, you know, I guess mitigate risk, right? And then over deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, what I'm seeing out there is, you know, we have a, you know, the risk free rate of return, let's say, is, a, you know, five and a half percent, five and a half percent on an FDIC insured money market account, right? And that's a demand deposit account. So they can access that cash today if they wanted to. Um, and uh, back in 2017, when I was raising, ca when I was raising capital, offering a seven, a seven percent fixed rate of return, when money market accounts were paying 0 0.02%, um, you know, that was 7% was better than a sharp stick in the eye. Um, so the tail that, you know, the two tails that kind of wag the dog is one, you know, we're buying 
commercial investment properties opportunistically. So we're agnostic, we're agnostic to asset class, but typically we're buying from mom and pops that have owned a property for a long time. So typically a sub two situation is not something that's going to be viable because a lot of these people don't have any debt on the property. Right. Um, so we have to factor in higher debt costs in terms of annual debt service into our operating costs. So therefore we have to buy the property cheaper to do that. The second tail is our investors want nine, ten percent in terms of an, you know annual distributions during the hold period, and so uh, then we have to like buy the property even cheaper than that to satis- you know to satisfy those types of re- uh, those types of returns, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what I have been seeing, at least in the commercial space, is I've been seeing just crazy. I mean, I've been in real estate for real estate for seventeen years, and I haven't seen things get so creative from a financing standpoint in this high interest rate environment. Um, And it's the first time I'm actually seeing buyers and sellers work together as a team to create win-win situations such as, well, I don't want to sell it for less than 1.8 million. Well, I can't pay more than 1.6 because interest rates are, you know, eight, you know, eight percent, eight and a half percent. So I've been seeing situations where the seller is like, well, okay, 1.8 is like, that's like my bottom line number. So what I'll do is I'll hold a second position mortgage at 0% interest, zero payments with a balloon for that balance at the end of five years for that 200,000. Um, mm-hmm. Like just crazy stuff like that in this, like in this environment. So I think that there's, you know, People are scared, but this is where the you know immense amount of opportunities are uh, are created is when we kind of have this like you know uncert- uncertainty in the marketplace. Once we know that we're in a recession um, and that we've you know bottomed out of the recession, a lot of those opportunities are going to be squeezed out because then people start developing confidence, getting more clarity as where the economy is going, and then you start having another you know another bubble. Like Robert Kiyosaki says, that, you know we don't produce you know we don't produce anything in this country anymore. We produce bubbles. <laughs> So, um, so I think that, uh, that's kind of what we've been seeing, uh, been seeing out there when we've been talking to, uh, investment partners. Uh, what about you, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. People are definitely getting creative. Uh, sellers are still hanging on for those prices and the buyers just are more reluctant to pay them. So I've had a lot of deals that have come very, very close and then not been able to cross the finish line just from these small gaps. Uh, so I think it's, it is important that people think outside of the box when it comes to closing deals. Otherwise there's going to be a lot of product just kind of sitting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even agents are more willing to listen. Right. Um, especially, I mean, I, I get messages on Facebook and, and LinkedIn from agents that see my posts and they're like, Hey, you know, it's dead right now. Right. Um, do you have any deals or anything I can do for you? Right. Agents are, which, also hasn't happened before where agents are willing to work with wholesalers to get the deals done for the buyers and the sellers. That's exactly how this creative finance niche has grown and, and, and became, you did not see this two, three, four, five years ago. Everybody was like, Nope, we, we don't do that. <laughs> right. So now it's more of a team effort, right? And real estate is always a team effort, but, there's always that difference between investors, right? And, and then an agent, they don't want to talk to each other. Like, I don't like agents. And then, you know, <laughs> I don't like investors because blah, 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 blah. Right. So I, I love the, the fact that there's been more of a unity in, in creation of a, of, of a working environment between buyer sellers, as well as agents and wholesalers, right? Which these are the investors making the deals happen. Right. So yeah, it's crazy. So is your fund technically a blind fund then, since you haven't identified the properties that you're going to be purchasing until you've raised the money? That That is correct, Mark. We, uh, we've we identified markets, the type of markets by definition, but not mm-hmm. the properties. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a blind fund. What did the, uh, just out of curiosity, what did the legal fee- fees end up being for something like that? Just ballpark is fine. Um, well, we had a great deal from our community, right? So, um, I would, I think I would have been around 18 to 20,000, but legal fees, 15 K, but then everything else, the marketing and everything else we built, we're at 75,000, 
which mm -hmm. includes about 35,000 from the masterminds that we had to join, the conference we went to, the courses I bought to yeah. you know, learn how to build it all. Yeah. Now, do, do the attorneys bill you by the hour or do they give you like a set fee up front? They said, you get, you said, Hey, this is what I want to do. And they said, okay, that's going to cost 15 grand. Or were they like, uh, oh, my hourly rate is thousand dollars and I'm just gonna send you bills until I'm done. Yeah. Um, great question. So when it comes to creating this, you know, syndication of fund of the attorneys that we work with, um, essentially just create a package and this, this has, you know, your PPM private place memorandum and it has your blue sky filings. Right. And it has your operating agreement for or your limited partnership agreement for our fund. We did it. We did it with a limited partnership and in a general partner. And it also has your general partner entity creation as well as a fund creation. Right. And then lastly, it has either the operating agreement for the general partner. The only thing that does not have is it's not included is, is the fees. Right. So like filing fees. And so so that's basically their fee plus the filing fees we're talking about um probably like three to four thousand dollars just in fees to create all these entities and file the mm -hmm. blue sky and all that right so yeah i mean we're literally probably 15 15 16 000. and today the same the structure would be 20 grand all in fifteen thousand mm -hmm. plus four to five thousand in fees mm -hmm. so, so is so, that is that kind of like a flat rate then or does your attorney bill you by the hour no, it's not by the hours. It's a package. No, it's it's package. Okay. So we have about four minutes left before we wrap up. I did want to end on kind of pulling the thread at deal flow as a subject. Uh, it sounds like deal flow is a bottleneck um, for you know getting in front of uh, op you know opportunities. You need like about two to three hundred a month going across your desk. Um, what's your strategy for rapidly accelerating that? Um, uh, that deal flow so you can get uh, more opportunities to underwrite and therefore uh, grow the fund holdings. Great question, uh, Matt. Deal flow is not a bottleneck, but it could be, mm -hmm. right? And, and the reason why it's not yet, obviously, is is because w we've built the relations. We're not in the acquiring process, uh, phase yet. So we're underwriting properties and we're getting deals, but all we need to do is open up and then join these creative finance groups. And we know exactly who the deals are going through. There's major groups, right? Mm -hmm. So the next step would be, Hey, we're ready to launch, ready to start acquiring, right? We go to join these groups, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is the same way I, I built the deal flow in Houston, right? Mm -hmm. So I have deal flow in Houston. I just, we just don't have deal flow in the, in the additional markets because there's no need to spend that time. But, but yeah, we have a strategy there to to join and infiltrate the network, right? That's how we're going to get our deals. So we, not necessarily farming our own deals or acquisition. We uh, we're not in the business of of acquiring properties as of yet. Maybe fun to you know we buy we might build an acquisition team. You know that's a long term goal. Yeah, I was thinking when you were mentioning uh, communities, I was like, I, I just I went to the Bigger Pockets conference in um, in Orlando in October. And uh, there was like so many Pace Morby um, uh, people, like people that are there. And I was thinking like, oh, geez, like, you know, for deal flow, you like, you know, you uh, join like Pace Morby's community and then uh, you just like, you know, hammer out the message there of exactly what you're looking, you know, what you're looking for and what you're offering, because there's a lot of hustlers out there. And, and I d can definitely appreciate, you know, instead of trying to build out this infrastructure ourselves, let's partner with the people that have built out the infrastructure to lean on them for deal for deal sourcing because that's what their number one focus uh, focus is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So no, that's pretty uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, everything I've learned is from has been from Pace and 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 his YouTube ninety five thousand YouTube videos <laughs> right, and his courses and stuff. So um, in deal flow, it's one of their strategies is that group, right? Mm -hmm. So. We uh, we love everything they're doing, and that these are the guys that that we do business with right now, right? Mm -hmm. the guys from nice. this. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, awesome. sounds yeah. good. We're at the top of the hour. Top of the hour. If anybody's looking to get a hold of George, uh, George Salas three sixty dot com. Uh, any other shout outs you want to make before we? Um, I you want to connect, and now I've got lots of social media stuff happening out there. We've got my YouTube channel, and um, and then. You know, our website, you know, Empress Capital is out there. And, 
you know, if you want to connect, just hit me up. And appreciate you, gentlemen, having me in the podcast, man. Thank you so much. Hope to- yeah, with your background, you should probably plan your own event, right? That's got to be coming down at some soon. point. Soon, soon, soon. We're working on it. <laughs> nice. yeah. well, when you got it on the calendar, let us know and we'll, we'll promote it for you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's quite a bit of work to, to put those together. Right. So we're, it's just strategically that's secondary, right. First creating our relationships and our partners and building the infrastructure for those two with partners, right. Fund management partners, and then also retail investors. And then once we've built infrastructure, which we're in the process of, then we'll do our event. But yeah, I'll keep you updated for sure. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on and uh, thanks to everybody that tuned in. We'll see you uh, next week. All right. Hey, take care.